I'm really happy to be back at the Ultimate Seminar. This is probably, I don't even know how many years it's been, but it's been very many. I've, I think I've missed one year in the past few years. So I'm delighted that we're, we're here virtually or otherwise. Um, so today, I'm joined by Merck Mercuriadis, who is one of the leading figures in the music industry today. If you don't know Merck, you're about to find out a lot about him. He's a really, really interesting guy. Merck started out in Canada as a scrappy but determined new kid at Virgin Records in the 1980s before working his way up to CEO at um, Sanctuary Group, where Merck managed the careers of everyone from, wait for this, Beyonce and Destiny's Child to Elton John and Kiss. In 2017, he set up his own business, which is called Hypnosis Songs Fund, which is a company offering investors the chance to make money from the royalties generated from thousands of songs by famous artists. The catalog includes hit songs from Blondie, Beyonce, Al Green, The Arrhythmics, Barry Manilow, The Dream, Timberland, Mark Ronson, and The Chainsmokers. And that is literally just to name a few. If anyone has a good few stories up their sleeves, it's Merck, and I'm delighted to be talking to you today, Merck. Hey, how you doing? Here he is. Hiya. What's good? Hopefully Arsenal beat Leeds today, and then we'll have a, a lovely weekend. It's football, is it? You see, that's where... Well, I've just, fin I've just finished listening to John Coltrane, to Ravel, and to the new Salt album, so I feel like I'm caught up on my listening. You've done some good listening today. Well done. I listened to, well, I listened to Jay Huss today, and I've listened to some Arlo Parks. That's been my Sunday. Uh, I love Arlo Parks. I think, ah. I mean, I, I, you know, Jay Hassa, I have respect for, but Arlo Parks, I think, is really, really special. You see, me too, me too. I think she's going to have a great 2021. Great Indeed. 2021. So, Mark, you listen, you've had, you've had an amazing career. Um, it's touched the careers, uh, the world, and the world, it's touched the world of some of the biggest musicians on the planet. Before we get into the sort of that amazing story, let's get to the starting point of your musical journey. When did you first fall in love with music? Well, you know, Literally, when I was five or six years old, um, my parents had uh, restaurants and the restaurants had jukeboxes and the jukeboxes came with 45 singles. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just fell in love. And, and, you know, I was very, very lucky because while my parents were working, I was really raised by, by my grandmother. Um, she didn't speak English. She only spoke Greek. And uh, she had a real connection with music, though. And when I would play music, she would either approve or disapprove. Not that it made much of an impact in terms of if she disapproved of something, but she really sort of taught me to listen and to listen carefully. And I found that when I was listening to these records and I was, you know, really obsessed, as I say, even at five, six, seven years of age, um, I would daydream about what I might do in music. And it was very clear to me, but you know, my grandmother taught me about intuition and instinct and she called it the voice of God inside of you. And this voice of God inside of me was very, very clear that I was never going to be Robert Plant or Neil Young or Jimmy Page, <laughs> that I had to figure out a, a, a different path. So even at that very young age, I started to read everything that I could possibly read. I would go to the library, I would pick up books, and I would try and I would, you know, started to read Cream magazine and Rolling Stone and The Enemy and Sounds and Melody Maker. Um, I lived in a little town in Canada, but because Canada was a British colony, we would get the British music papers, albeit a few weeks late. Yeah. Um, but we would still get them. So I would read these things cover to cover, cover to, and you know, I lived in a town of 2000 people. There wasn't anything else to do except for, you know, play hockey in the winter times and baseball in the summer times. So I was just constantly listening to music, constantly reading. And I find, found myself, you know, at the same time as I was falling in love with Neil Young, I was leading, reading about, er, you know, Elliot Roberts, his manager, or, you know, being Led Zeppelin obsessed, you know, Beatles obsessed. I would read about Brian Epstein or, or, or you know, Peter Grant. And that sort of started to pave uh, a way for me where by the time I was 13 or 14 years old, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. It was already, you know, kind of percolating in my thoughts and I was, you know, manifesting my way. And just to, just to point out, Peter and Bernie, for those that don't know, Peter and Bernie were the people that were behind the scenes, right? They were, they were the people that uh, were working with the Beatles. And Absolutely. You know, Brian Epstein was the, was, was the manager of, of, of the Beatles, Peter Grant, you know, 
was the manager of Led Zeppelin, Elliot Roberts was the manager of Neil Young. And these were the sort of people that I, I, you know, equally well, I was obsessed with Jimmy Page and Robert Plant and with John Paul George and Ringo and Neil, but I was just as obsessed with their managers. And, you know, I would read all the line and notes and figure out, you know, who designed the sleeves, who was the A&R person, who the arranger was, you know, who the songwriters were, et cetera, just so that I really knew, you know, A, what mattered to me, B, what didn't matter to me, and C, I would then start to be able to use that knowledge to my advantage. It's interesting. I did exactly the same as a kid. I would go through, I would go through Madonna, Prince, and I would write down all the producers and engineer credits and, and see where they would, you know, for example, someone like Nar, who you of course work with, you know, oh Nar Rogers pops up on this record, but he's also working in this genre of music. So yeah, that kind of I guess that literal record collector kind of train potter I- type. I, I was very privileged for, you know, to manage Elton John and, and Elton did the same thing as a kid. Elton would literally, you know, have books where he wrote every record down that was in the charts, every songwriter, every producer, every arranger, you know, he'd color code them, cross reference them, et cetera, because like us, he was obsessed. So you, so here you are, you're in, you're in a small town in Canada. You're obsessed with music. How did you? Well, I read that you that you bombarded um, Virgin Records for your first job. Um, is that the case? Like, how did you, how did you go from wanting to, to to work somewhere in the music industry, possibly in management or behind the scenes, to actually manifesting that and making it happen? The the great hero of Virgin Records um, is a man that we don't celebrate enough. You know, we all talk about Richard Branson, and of course, there have been terrific people that have worked at Virgin Records through the years. But the, the, the real hero of Virgin Records was a guy called Simon Draper. And Simon was uh, Richard Branson's cousin, and he had unbelievable taste. The greatest taste probably of, you know, any A&R man ever. So from, you know, Tangerine Dream and Mike Oldfield through to Simple Minds and OMD and the Human League and UB40 and XTC and the Sex Pistols and Public Image Limited, you know, straight through, he he was the guy. And, you know, he, he really understood music. He had great taste. And I would bombard him with letters and 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 um, just say, you know, listen, I, I really love this record. You know, I think that record's terrible. Um, you know, <laughs> those, those sorts of things that, you know, precocious kids do. Sure. Um, when, uh, and, it, and it wasn't, Machiavelli and it wasn't with a view of you know to getting a job or anything like that okay. it was it was you know really from the point of view of of, of just you know because what I recognized was that some record labels were more friendly artist friendly than others right and 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 the virgin records that I was in love with was letting bands like you know Faust and Henry Cow very very obscure artists make records right and they they really believed in everything and then you know it got to the point where simon's taste caught up with you know the sort of you know popular zeitgeist as you were so you know this was the only record label you know bar a couple you know island records being another where you know what appeared to be left of center artists you know amazing artists like simple minds were not just making records but they were having hit songs as well um, because the label believed in them and you know before i knew it i had a job and uh it was a real eye-opener for me because i wasn't sophisticated enough i was still in, in 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 my teens and i wasn't sophisticated enough to realize that um working for an artist friendly record company and working for the artist were two different things. So we had this, you know, I was a marketing person. We had this, you know, incredible success um, with the artists that I was particularly uh, excited about, particularly Simple Minds, Human League, OMD, UB40, David Sylvian, um, you know, amazing, amazing people. Um, And they let me become a part of signing an artist as a result of of the success that I was having as a marketing person. And that artist was this Canadian girl called Mary Margaret O'Hara, who was incredible. Um, and Jeremy Lascelles, uh, who was the head of A&R at the time, and Simon, and, you know, we all love this, this 
this this woman. She was just unbelievable. But in in the process of the making of that record, that was the first time when the light bulb went off, and I suddenly realized that hold on a second, you're not actually working for the artist. You're working for the record company, and 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 ultimately. It's Richard Branson's agenda that you have to follow, not the artist's agenda that you have to follow. Um, and as much as I love Virgin Records, um, you know, I wanted to be part of the artist, uh, uh, part of the artist's world, much, much more than that. Um, so I found myself with two guys: a guy called Andy Taylor and a guy called Rod Smallwood, um, who were both. 15, 16 years older than I was. They were managing Iron Maiden and Iron Maiden was having its first real blush of success. And uh, Rod was uh, totally creative. Um, they'd been best friends at, at, at Cambridge uh, together. Rod was 100% creative. He uh, loved sport. Uh, Andy was a hundred percent business. He hated sport. The only two things that these two guys had in common were that they loved women and they loved drinking. And one of them could drink, you know, a quart of, or, you know, whatever it was, a, a you know, bottle of whiskey and uh, couldn't remember a thing the next morning. And the other one would drink the same, you know, bottle of whiskey or rum, and he would remember, you know, the tiniest, you know, clause of a recording agreement that he had agreed, you know, 64 page recording agreement that he had agreed um, while uh, being halfway through that bottle of rum. And I, I became the, the, the bastard offspring of, of the two of them. Um, and the 21 years that we had together at Sanctuary were incredible because you know, we took it from being Iron Maiden's management company to being Elton's management company, Beyonce's management company, Morrissey's management company, um, Fleetwood Mac's management company, and on and on and on. And we built Bravado merchandise and, and, and you know, from what Barry, Drink, Barry and Keith Drinkwater had built up to that point. We created uh, the biggest booking agency in Europe, which is now what the, the bones of CAA are. Um, so it was a wonderful company. Um, and it also gave me my first taste of being involved with the city, uh, which was not successful ultimately. And it taught me an awful lot that I've now put into hypnosis um, to ensure that uh, hypnosis is ship shape. Just to, just to back up on there, uh, one thing. Actually, back up on two things. First of all, just you said that you wrote all those letters and stuff, and it it always interests me how people get in the line between bombarding someone and harassing and being a pain in the bum. What uh, for you? But, but ultimately, getting the job or getting that foot in the door, you need. For you, what's the line? When if, if someone is approaching you to work at hypnosis, it seems to me what you did was the perfect approach. You know, you actually showed an interest, you had opinions, and I'm assuming that's why, you know, you were taken into Virgin, but, but how, what's the line, what's the line between sort of harassment and determination? And, and for you, what kind of impresses you when you see new, new younger people coming through that you think, I might, I might give this person a shot. How can people kind of learn from what you've done and, and, and tailor it to themselves? Well, being, being a kid from a town of 2000 people who went from, you know, kissing a girl for the first time at age 13 or 14 to an Elton John record to managing Elton John, um, I, I pay attention to everything. So, you know, my wife, sometimes I drive her crazy because it doesn't matter who, you know, manages to get my details or whether they're contacting me on social media or, or you know, via email or phone or whatever, texting, whatever it might be. I pay attention to everything because you just don't know who the next great artist or great executive is. And I'm, you know, because of, of what I was describing earlier, I'm as obsessed with finding the next great executive as I am with finding the next great artist or signing, you know, these legendary songwriters that, that, and artists that we're working with. So I, I pay attention to it all. But the, the most important thing that you can do to impress me is just be authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, if, if you're not coming at it from a straightforward point of view that shows me, you know, the, 
advice that I give most people, um, which I really believe is the best advice that I can give them, is find an artist that nobody knows about, that you think is amazing, that you believe in, and make the rest of the world believe in them. And if you can do that, then you can write your ticket in 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 this business and that is honestly the best advice that i can give anyone because if someone comes to me with you know and and not only displays authenticity but displays the ability to have identified you know an artist that's you know in its incubation period or it's in its in its early formative stages you know that's really impressive to me you know and and as we know there are you know, and I'm not sure why this is the case, but there are far more great artists out there, you know, in incubating and, and in their formative stages than there are executives or managers. Mm -hmm. So if you can show up with, with you know, we, we've just signed, um, you know, we bought Big Deal Music in Los Angeles uh, a few months ago, and uh, Dave Ayers and Kenny McPherson and the team there have signed this young, band called geese g-e-e-s mm -hmm. uh, which is a young band from from you know it's the first new band from new york city that i've heard in a long time and this kid is so unbelievably new york that it's exciting because you know you have to think back to you know the strokes to think of you know the last great band to come out of new york city you know i'm talking you know not hip-hop because uh, obviously there's, a, there's amazing hip-hop that comes out of New York all the time. But, uh, uh, and you know, The Strokes was, you know, 20 years after the last great band that had come from, so not that many great bands come out of New York, um, but, uh, um, you know, this is a great one. And, and you know, the kids that are, are, are managing that band, um, to me, I wanna know everything about them because I'm just as, in, as, as interested in, in the, the, the kids that have found them and brought them to our attention as I am in the band itself. Well, but I do think, sorry, sorry to cut you off, I, I do think that everyone that's in this business owes it to themselves though to, you know, investigate every lead because you just don't know. I mean, we, you know, the, the, we all say that there will never be another John, Paul, George and Ringo, but we don't know that. We don't know that, and we don't know. We don't know that's when people said we, we don't know. There's you know Beyonce. We didn't. We don't know there's gonna be another yeah. Rihanna. What? Just just um, in terms of when you, when you were at hypnosis, I mean, just just talking about that label that you just bought into there and those guys that are working there. You you went out. You started out at Virgin. Um, you left and you went to Sanctuary Group, and you were presumably well within within years you were CEO of of Sanctuary. So, what would you say are some of the things that you have done? starting out lower on the ladder and becoming essentially the big boss what do you think you do what do you think you managed to do so right what is it what was it about you during those years that that was so successful do you think um i think the ability to understand talent whether that's artists or songwriters or producers um you know i think that that um what is missing um from most artists and songwriters and producers lives is somebody that's listening to them um, not just giving them, you know, because I've, I've never been a Svengali, so I've never been somebody that sees somebody's talent and looks upon it, you know, from the perspective of what can it do for me, right? I, I, I come at it from the approach that um, if I can help the artist achieve their dreams, um, then I'm going to do well at the same time. So, you know, my modus operandi, if you like, is to listen. And it doesn't matter whether it's a brand new artist um, that uh, no one knows about yet, or whether, you know, it's these great songwriters that I'm, I'm, I'm buying from and, and, and bringing to hypnosis. The first thing I'm doing is listening to what it is that's important to those people. And I'm trying to figure out whether the things that are important to them are things that I can help them achieve and make, you know, because if you know, people talk about, you know, Hollywood log lines, you know, what, you know, distill this movie down to one line. If, if there's a log line in terms of what I do, it's I make people believe in the things that I believe in. But because this is an integrity based business, 
you know, you have to genuinely believe. You can't just try and sell somebody on something, right? And I, I don't believe that I ever sell. So, you know, from my point of view, you know, if I call you up and say, Hattie, you know, play this record on your radio show, you know, this at, you know, this artist is incredible, this song is incredible, and you take a listen to it and you find out that in fact what I've said is not true, and I've just wasted five or ten minutes of your time. The next time I call you up and say, Hey Hattie, I found this, the, you know, I've got this record, it's amazing please play it. You're just going to not even bother to listen because I've wasted your time. So I've, I've always been careful through the years to never ever do or say anything that the music can't live up to. Um, and you know, that's something that I think is, is, is really important is to listen to the artists, not just listen to their music, but listen to what it is that is important to them. Because if you spend enough time around the artist or the songwriter or the producer, and you get a sense of how they conduct themselves. You know, when we're doing an interview like this, you know, you're gonna tell me the things that are important to you. I'm gonna tell you the things that are important to me, but it's actually the underlying stuff that really tells you the most interesting stuff about people. So, you know, you can be with someone in a recording studio or at, at their home and they might receive a letter and the way that they react to that letter will tell you a lot more about them than anything that 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 they may say you know whether it's paying a bill or you know whatever the the the, the case might be so i i spend an awful lot of time around people listening and paying attention and looking at the energy of them and then putting them that to work to you know on, on their behalf as opposed to on my behalf and as I say, I, I, I operate on the basis that if I'm doing what they need, if I'm making their idea, you know, their ideas come to fruition, of course you enhance them, you let the, you let people know, well, you know, look, this idea, if we took it and we did this and this and this, you get where you want it to be, but this is a way that we can do it that has the best chance of success. All of that stuff comes into it, but ultimately when you distill it down, you're trying to help them achieve their dreams and at the same time, it's helping achieve your dreams as well, but you're not trying to make them fit into, you know, the, the, the round peg that you think is, is, is where things should be. It's interesting you say that about the observation, because with my journalist hat on, with, when I'm working for Vogue or The Guardian, one thing I always, when I'm media training other artists, when I'm media training artists, I always say to them, be super, as soon as you step in the room with a journalist and as soon as you leave the room, all of that is, is going to be, looked upon for color and for and for clues i find the i, I find the most uh, revealing parts of dealing with an artist is is that point when they walk in and they do whatever they're doing and then when they leave again that's when you can really find out about find out about people so uh, it's worth being very aware <laughs> worth being very aware if you're an artist how, how you know how you approach that so you, you know you're talking you, you're talking about you know really listening to the artist um, and how important that is. I wondered, what, what's the difference? What sort of different skill sets might you have to employ when managing, for instance, Elton John, um, um, as opposed to, or it may be similar to someone like Beyonce? What are the sort of different approaches, or is it always is, is it always the same, and you just adapt? Well, it's it's the same in the sense that you know, and this is this is my approach. So it's not to say that it it's it's the right approach for everyone. I'm I'm looking for and and this by the way is true for you know my children it's true for the people that work with me and for me you know you you try to find out what it is that gives that person the utmost confidence mm -hmm. right, so that they can do their best right they can be their best and you know going back to the concept of you know how someone reacts to a letter you know there are artists and songwriters and producers and executives that never ever want to have to pay a bill, that never want that stuff to get in the way of, of their creation because it's a buzzkill. And then there are others that absolutely want to be able to do that. They want to be able to open up their sky bill. They want to be able to open up their electricity bill. They want to be able to write the check or you know go online and, and make the payment themselves because it's grounding and that becomes useful to their creativity. So, you know, when you look at someone like Elton who tours 
you know, almost constantly, obviously not now in, in, in this moment, but the minute that, that, that this moment allows for touring, he'll be back out on the road and, and, and doing his thing. In the, the, the period of time that I worked with him, the most important thing was how do you keep Elton so that he's, you know, doesn't have to worry about all the little shit and is just completely focused on how's he going to be his best self that night because he's somebody that takes performing live mm. more seriously than any other artist that I've ever come across with the exception of maybe Nile Rodgers. And, you know, he's, you know, Elton's live performances are legendary for a reason because he gives everything of himself to that audience on that night. And, you know, his day, you know, he'll be in the arena from, you know, two o'clock, in the afternoon just soaking up the vibe of the place and 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 you know and, you know getting a feel for what it is that, that 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 he's about to do he takes it unbelievably seriously he might be talking to people on the telephone he might be yeah. you know, doing you know looking at his bobbleheads or different things but he takes it very very seriously so you know you want to eliminate someone like that having to think about is my food going to be right? Are my clothes going to be right? Are the, you know, the, you know, and, and it's different, you know, every, every person, um, uh, you know, ticks differently. Someone like Morsi, you can manage Morsi for seven years and, you know, see him maybe three times physically in the entire period. You can be at shows every night and you'll never, ever get to talk to him other than by email or you know, texting or, or or whatever the case may be, because he just doesn't want anyone to enter his space, right? right. And most people can't handle it. Most from for most people, their egos cannot handle not being able to walk into the dressing room and say, "I'm here," right? <laughs> and expect that the artist is going to fawn over them or or whatever. But with Morrissey, no, you have to understand that that's not going to happen. And you're not going to get in the dressing room and there's going to be six people that will stop. Even though you're the, you know, quote unquote, the boss, there are six people that are paid to stop you from getting into the dressing room because that would just be a complete buzzkill for Morrissey and would interfere with the quality of the performance or the quality of the record making. So you have, to, you know, you, you, you have to serve the art and you have to serve the artist. So, you know, people talk all the time about, you know, how artists are difficult I, I never ever think that the artist is difficult because I always remember how much I love the art that they make. And therefore, whatever it is that, that, you know, that you have to go through, whether it's as a psychologist or a counselor or, you know, however people want to look at it, to me, it's always worthwhile. It doesn't matter. You know, I've told this story before, but, um, uh, you know, people think it's funny, which is that, you know, Ed Bicknell, who I think is one of the greatest managers of all time, who managed Dire Straits at the heart of their career, um, he was managing Brian Ferry. And this was in the, the mid-1980s. Well, 1980, I, I can tell you exactly when it was. It was, you know, 86 going into 87. Okay. Um, and the reason why I remember is because the story that I'm about to tell is is, you know, deals with the sort of legendary uh, 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 hurricane or, or storm that took place in, in, in London uh, in England in, in October of 1987. Um, so I, I run into Ed Bicknell um, a few months later at what was then known as the New Music Seminar in, in New York, which was like a yearly alternative music seminar that the music industry would descend on New York from all over the world and, you know, discover, you know, who the new artists were. So I, I see Ed and I'm a Brian Ferry obsessive. So I go up to Ed and say, Hey, you know, how's, how's everything going? And we're having a chat and, and, and the mutual, uh, a uh, friend that we both have is Peter Grant, the Led Zeppelin manager that, that, that I spoke about earlier. And I said to him, listen, it's amazing you're managing Brian Ferry. How's that going? And he said, oh, I, I don't manage Brian anymore. And I said, why not? And he said that, you know, remember the, the storm that we had last October, a little, little while back? And I said, yes. And he said, well, a tree fell on Brian's house. And he rang me up at three o'clock in the morning asking me to sort 
spit it out. He said, I don't need that in my life. And I was like, fucking hell, I'm dying to sort out trees falling on artists' houses or whatever problem it is that they have because I've always just been so obsessed with music that, you know, as long as I respect the, the artist's art and it doesn't matter whether they're, you know, uh, brand new or whether they've been doing it for 20 years, as long as I love the art, I'm prepared to do whatever it takes. So not without naming names necessarily, because I'm sure you probably can't. What's the craziest thing that you, or, or the most outrageous thing you've had to do for an artist? I can't talk about that. <laughs> I, I had a feeling <laughs> you might say that, but I had a feeling. Um, you know, part of the, the, the um, uh, success, if you like, or part of the longevity is integrity. Course. And yeah. part of the integrity is is understanding that that um, you know I mean I I guess what I will say in, in, you know for for those that you know maybe don't totally get it is that you know God's when God gives this kind of talent to people it's generally because he's fucked something else up in their lives right, right. so 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 you know everyone is imperfect right I. I I may be a good communicator. I may be good at, 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 you know, various things in business and in, in life and in listening to artists, but I'm uh, about as far from perfect as you can possibly get. And it's the same thing for great artists. So, you know, once you get into the nitty gritty of it all and you figure out what it is that, that makes them confident and you figure out how to help, remove the roadblocks most of which are roadblocks that they put up for themselves um and you know because they're not confident um so once you figure out how to remove those roadblocks then you just get on with it and you don't talk about it mm. yeah that makes absolute total sense otherwise you wouldn't have a you wouldn't be the guy you were today you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't be in the position that you are makes total sense so obviously we, we want to get to um to your own company now Mark, which is which is of course hypnosis which has a really diverse um, array of, of array of artists on, on the books. Um, as I said earlier, there's, you know, there's Timberland, there's the Kaiser Chiefs, uh, Chainsmokers, Fraser T. Smith. And before um, before I sort of looked into the company, I assumed well, I, did, I, I assumed that um, you were open to every every sort of person and, and, and every type of catalogue. But what I've come to understand is actually that legacy, in terms of publishing, anyway, in terms of what you guys are doing at Hypnosis, is that actually legacy can be quite important and. and um, Legacy acts are almost your breadwinners. Is that right? Is that in terms of how you've assembled the catalogue? Is that right? Do you try and weight it towards the sort of legacy acts? Um, um, no. The the two criteria is that the songs have to be extraordinarily successful, mm -hmm. um, and they have to be of great cultural importance. Right. That's you know, and that's not because I'm a snob or an elitist, but you know, I I want Nile Rodgers to be proud to be standing next to Debbie Harry, who's proud to be standing next to Mark Ronson, who's proud to be standing next to Timbaland, who's proud to be standing next to Fraser T. Smith, who's proud to be standing next to Dave Stewart and the Eurythmics, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, you know, I've, I've built, you know, the, 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 the premise of the company was built, which is that, these great songs have predictable, reliable income, uh, um, and therefore are investable, mm -hmm. because you know the investment community, um, you know, it, it, that's what it's looking for is predictability and reliability, and that's why things like Golden Oil are so successful because they've been predictable and reliable for decades for the most part. But these great songs are even better because they're the revenues of these great songs are not correlated to what's happening in the marketplace. So, you know, if you're living your best life, you're celebrating with the soundtrack of great songs equally well. If you're experiencing challenges, um, you know, you're taking comfort and escaping with great songs. So music is always being consumed, particularly now that we're in a streaming paradigm where it's once again more convenient for people to consume music legally, music is always being consumed and it's always generating money. If Donald Trump wakes up tomorrow morning or Boris Johnson wakes up tomorrow morning and does something stupid as they inevitably will, um, you know, then at that point in time, the price of gold and oil will be affected, mm -hmm. but the, but, but the revenues of songs are not affected. And, you know, we wouldn't have wished for, a pandemic 
to prove my point, but if if anything is true, is that during the course of this pandemic, music um, has been stronger than ever, and you know we've gone uh, you know from being a FTSE 250 company to being one of the biggest yielders on the FTSE 250. So there are, there are only something like 30 companies now that are paying bigger dividends to their shareholders than we are because you know most businesses have failed during this time but music has continued to go on and on and on and i had a really strong suspicion um seven or eight years ago when i started to hatch the plot of hypnosis that this would be the case because i could see that streaming was going to blow the pie up i had uh even 11 years ago when i first met daniel eck and martin lawrence and um and they'll tell you this. The first thing that I said to them is, look, you know, you guys have un- got to understand that you're about to change the music industry because what you're doing is you're giving the passive consumer who has never, ever paid for music before a reason to pay for music. You know, in, 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 in the old pre-streaming business, the, the benchmark for extraordinary success was you know, having a platinum album, you know, 300,000 copies in the UK or a million copies in the US. If we use the US as, as the microcosm, you know, you're talking about selling a million records in a country that has 360 million people in it, right? So one out of every 360 people, that immediately tells you that the average person, while they may love music, they're happy to hear it ostensibly for free on the radio or to see it on television, but they're never pulling a tenor out of their pocket and paying for it. Now those same people, which again are 359 out of every 360 people are paying 120 quid or $120 a year for music, not because they want me or you or Timbaland or Mark Ronson or Nile Rogers to get paid, but because it's more convenient. Right. It's, it's, it's like valet parking. Why do we pay for valet parking? Because it's convenient and it's easy and, and the price paid. So this tenor a month that you pay to be able to listen to everything from Bach to the Beatles or Chopin to Chic and wherever you want, whether it's at home or, you know, at work on the beach in the gym, it doesn't take up space on your telephone. The public has voted for that. And what has happened is that music has gone from being a discretionary or luxury purchase to now being a utility purchase, right? So it's just like the lecky, right? It's like you pay your tenor a month and you know that when you push play, it's going to be there and that you can listen to whatever you want, when you want. And we've gone from, you know, 50 million paid subscribers less than three years ago around the world to 400 million today to what will be 450 million by the end of this year to what will be, you know, 2 billion people as pre- if, if, if we yeah. you know, achieve what's predicted by the end of the decade. And what that has allowed us to do is with the biggest institutional investors in the world, people like the Church of England, Investec, um, you know, Aviva, AXA, Newton, um, you know, we've been able to establish songs as an asset class. And we've gone from being, you know, a company that was listed at 200 million pounds two years ago and two, two, point, two years and four months ago to being on the specialist fund segment of the London stock market to being a company that, you know, then graduated a year later to being a premier listing um, to now being, as I say, a FTSE 250 company um, that is, you know, amongst the biggest yielders on on the index. And this is not just great for me and for the people that are a part of hypnosis. It's great for every creator because we've taken songs and the, you know, what is the core, uh, uh, you know, if you distill everything about music right down to the lowest common denominator, the lowest common denominator is the song. Um, And now everyone's songs are worth more money as a result. And when I did this, I I set out to do it with an, you know, I had my motive, which is um, as with any business, I wanted to make money for myself and my shareholders. Um, But I also had an ulterior motive, which is that I wanted to use the leverage of 
owning these great songs and having this kind of financial wherewithal where we're now a 1.4, almost 1.4 billion pound market cap company to change where the songwriter sits in the economic equation. And the songwriter is the low man or woman on the totem pole because the three biggest song companies in the world don't advocate for songwriters because they're owned by the three biggest recorded music companies in the world. And on the recorded music side of the business, you're getting four fifths of the revenue. You're getting an 80% gross margin, a 40% net margin. And in general, those record companies own those recordings in perpetuity. Very few artists actually own their own recordings. On the other side, the song side of the business, you've got a fifth of the revenue, you've got a fifth of the margin, and quite rightly, whether it's through renegotiations or reversions or good management or lawyering in the first place, the songs end up back in the hands of the people that co-created them. And we buy from those people, but what happens is that the three big recorded music companies use their leverage over the three big um, publishing companies that they control to stop them from advocating and fighting for the songwriter to be paid more money as they push all of the economic improvement in our business towards recorded music where they're getting the lion's share of the money at the expense of the songwriter. And I want to change the system and I recognize that it didn't matter that I might be successful or that I might manage powerful artists or songwriters or producers or that I might be logical or even likable. What would matter was, you know, ultimately when it came to this battle was, did you have the financial wherewithal um, and let real leverage to be able to be a catalyst for change? And that's really what, you know, so, so for me, that's really the reason why I'm doing this is and, and why I've brought this incredible set of songwriters together because we're going to change the system and ensure that songwriters get paid more money. It'll take three, four, five, six, seven years to get it done because we've got a lot of people that for good reason don't want to get it done, good reasons of, that are their own reasons. But it's, I guess it's important to say um, in, in saying all of this that, you know, when I talk about this, I'm not talking about the people that work at Universal, Warner, and Sony, um, all of which are fine companies and have incredible people that are unbelievably enthusiastic about music and that do incredible work. What I'm talking about is the paradigm that has existed for the better part of 75 years that most people are not even aware of. Um, you know, I, th I think that, 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 as I say, that Universal, Warner, and Sony and others out there do incredible work, but we have to change this paradigm that stops the three big song companies from advocating for songwriters, and we have to get the songwriters paid more money. And that's my intent. Well, great news for, for all the songwriters that are listening today. Um, I think it's the same the same with any any creative endeavor or or business endeavor when it comes from when it comes when of course yes you want to make money but when it comes from the heart or from wanting to change stuff or wanting to disrupt stuff that's when we can't when we tend to see the greatest success and I hope that people listening will sort of take that on board that it's not just about you know making a bit of cash or like you know hobnobbing around famous people it, it's really about disrupting culture and changing things and and creating what you're, you know, from what you've said, equitable business for everybody. I wondered, we've, we've got a question actually from, from um, I think it's, it's either Chloe or Cho uh, from, 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 you, from Zoom. And um, they ask, where do you look for new artists? So if, 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 if you're a new songwriter out there, how likely is it that, that um, hypnosis are going to be on the lookout for you and how will they catch your attention? So this company that I was referencing before, uh, which was called Big Deal Music in Los Angeles, but that is now called Hypnosis Songs Group. Um, that's run under me by Kenny McPherson. It's got an incredible team that includes Casey Robeson, Dave Ayers, uh, Jamie Serretta, Pete Robinson. Um, and this team is in what I call the song creation business. So, you know, the business that, that I'm primarily focused on is the song management business because we, you know, put everything into managing these songs with the same sort of responsibility that I manage artists with, because that's one of the things that I think is broken 
about the traditional publishing business is that these big publishers have as many as 20,000 songs per person. So they're just taking passive requests. They don't have um, the uh, bandwidth to be able to actively manage their songs. And in fact, that isn't really what their business model is. Their business model is to create new songs, right? So, you know, because if you work at, you know, those, in any publishing company, you realize that, you know, you're not going to get paid for what Chuck Berry did or what Lindsey Buckingham did or what Dave Stewart or Nile Rogers did. You're going to get paid by finding, you know, the new Benny Blanco or the new Andrew Watt, right? So that's where all the focus goes. They go out, they sign 10 new songwriters, they sign... Uh, uh, you know, artists and, 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 and producers, and they put a lot of time and energy into making sure that those people are put in the right rooms, that they're working with the right artists. Hopefully those turn into placements on those artists' records. Hopefully those placements turn into hits. And hopefully then, you know, you've got one out of those 10 that has succeeded wildly enough to pay for the nine that have failed. Um, and, uh, you know, they do that using the passive income from these great hits that they already own um, to underwrite that business. And I, I, to me, that's madness because I think that these great hits that have unbelievable demand. So, you know, when you look at our catalog, we own everything from Single Ladies Put a Ring on It to Don't Stop Believing to Living on a Prayer to Let's Stay Together to you know, good times, you know, we are family, sweet dreams are made of this, et cetera. I could go on all day. And rain. Oh, sorry, I'll carry on. You carry yeah. on. But you get more out of, yeah, Set Fire to the Rain is unbelievable. You know, you get more out of those songs by putting more into them and you put them in movies and TV commercials and video games and make sure that they're on the right playlists and that new artists are covering them and other songwriters are interpolating them, et cetera. And, you know, those songs have huge demand, so it doesn't take a lot to get people to want to uh, work with them. Um, so song management, I think, is the replacement for publishing. And I think that, you know, every artist that I hope that, every, you know, if I've done my job properly, every artist that is, is, is you know, listening today or that, 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 you know, comes across what we do, I hope that 10 years from now, you know, everyone has their manager, has their record company, has their publishing administrator, but ultimately also, you know, alongside their agent and everyone else, has their song manager. Because, you know, what makes songs so special is they become a part of the fabric of your life and they become a part of the fabric of, of, of society. So, you know, the records that I was talking about earlier that I was listening to as a kid, you know, whether it was In the Ghetto by Elvis Presley or Papa Was a Rolling Stone by The Temptations or Achilles' Last Stand by, the, by Led Zeppelin or, you know, Harvest by Neil Young, you know, Sgt. Pepper by The Beatles, I'm still listening to those records today. And I'll still be listening to them when I'm, you know, 60 and when I'm 70. And when I'm 80 and when I'm 90, if I knock on wood, get to that point. And it's the same thing for the young girl that fell in love with, with you know, back to black, you know, um, uh, you know, 12 years ago. And, you know, she's gone from being 14 to now being 26 to when she's 38, she'll still be listening to back to black. When she's 50, she'll still be listening, et cetera. So, you know, song management is something that everyone should wish to have. They should want people to be actively working, not just on their new songs, but on their catalog to get the most out of it. So going back to your question, 98% um, of our business is song management, buying these extraordinarily successful songs and managing them better than they have been before. But 2% of our business is, is, is what I call song creation, which is identifying, you know, these, these, these great new songs uh, or great new songwriters. And as I say, you know, you find someone like Teddy Geiger and you put her in the room with someone like Shawn Mendes. And before you know it, you've got six hit singles. So on the song management side of the business, we've got, you know, incredible people like Ted Cockle, you know, who ran Virgin EMI for for the last eight years, making it the number one record label in the UK. Amy Thompson, who's one of the greatest managers that has ever existed, you know, they are, are running the song management business. 
on the song creation side, it's Kenny McPherson and Casey Robeson um, and Dave Ayers and Jamie Serretta and Pete Robinson and that team that are, as I say, identifying those young songwriters. So we, we do both, but one greater than the other. Of course, makes sense. And, and in terms of the song creation hat on then, um, Dwayne, uh, sorry, DK Wayne from, um, from Zoom would like to know whether you judge or whether you as a business judge new artists, producers, writers, etc., cetera, um, without a social presence. How important is that, is that Instagram following to you guys? If you're a songwriter or a producer, it's not particularly important to begin with, although we'll put an awful lot of time and energy into making sure that, you know, because, you know, when you look at, at, at the greatest songwriter, you know, the, the greatest songwriters in the world right now, people like, you know, uh, Andrew Watt, Benny Blanco, you know, Mark Ronson, you know, uh, uh, Teddy Geiger, et cetera, all have big social media presence, um, you know, Joe Little, because they're connecting with their artists online, but that isn't necessary day one. Um, but if you're an artist um, that is developing, then the social media presence is very, very important on day one because you know that we're in a, a paradigm right now that is all about you know the artist having to prove that there's connectivity between what they're doing, you know, or an emotional connection between what they're doing at a very early stage um, and an audience. And, you know, I can remember Travis Scott coming into uh, uh, Tricky Stewart's office. Tricky Stewart uh, was my partner in a company called Red Zone and uh, uh, that developed, you know, songwriters and artists and producers um, eight years ago. And Travis walked in and he may not have had uh, any money in the bank, but he had eight people that were shooting every move that he made and, you know, creating content for him. And it didn't matter that he had gone from Houston to Los Angeles for a couple of days. He was still going to be making music in a studio that night and continually spitting out, you know, uh, 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 you know, beats and 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 songs that, that 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 people would connect with, and it's one of the reasons why Travis is one of the most important hip hop artists today. Is because from that day, he learned. You know, he 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 didn't. You know, and this is important for for um, D K Wayne. I didn't see what what the name was, but it's important to do this because, you know, if you develop that relationship with an audience directly you don't need to ask anyone permission for anything right and and this and and ultimately this is what any artist or songwriter or producer um, should really pay place at the very very top of their goals is independence right you know and and of course success in finance gives you a level of independence but having uh, uh, an audience that you're connected with and that is you know waiting for you to make your next move also gives you a tremendous amount of independence because then you're not going to have to listen to the opinions of a record company to do anything other than make what you're doing better. You know where record companies, uh, where artists fail and often blame record companies is when they don't know what they want for themselves, right? You know, there's the famous, uh, 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 you know, story of Lady Gaga, um, you know, and I'm delighted that we own so many of her incredible songs with Red One um, and Mark Ronson and, and, and others. But, you know, Gaga, um, who was very closely associated with Justin Tranter, a, a, song, a great songwriter that I worked with for many years, she was signed to Island Records and it was a complete disaster because she didn't have, uh, 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 you know, the I's dotted uh, or the T's crossed properly for the record company to fully understand what it was doing. And Island Records were a very hot record company at the time. So they sign her, you know, most of the incredible stuff is there already, but it's not explained um, and not, you know, executed well. So they sign her before they and they drop her before they ever release a record by the time she went into interscope 
she had books like, you know, six feet high, taller than she was, that outlined every move she wanted to make, how she wanted to make it. And she executed it all herself with the help of, of, of Troy Carter, who used to work for me, with the help of obviously Jimmy Iovine and Brenda Romano and Steve Berman and all the great people at, at, at Interscope in, in, in the US. And, you know, people like Ferdy when he was at, at Polydor here in the UK, they broke Gaga, but they broke Gaga because when she outlined that blueprint for them, everyone went, wow. It, you know, kind of goes back to what I was saying before, never say or do anything that the music can't, can't live up to. In the case of Gaga, the plan that she laid out, the music was, it was, it was a plan that supported the music beautifully. And all everyone had to do was make everyone else believe and they did it. And she's one of the biggest artists on the planet because of that. So I would absolutely encourage any artist and songwriter and producer as well to develop their connection with their audience via social media. It will ultimately mean that you don't have to ever ask anyone's permission and it will give the record company that, you know, chooses to support you uh, a blueprint to, you know, help bring your, your ideas and, and, and your songs to success. We're, just, we're, we're about to run out of time. We've got a few minutes left. Time for a couple more questions. Um, we're going to try and squeeze in as many as possible, but a simple yes or no, well, not a simple yes or no, but a rough, <laughs> a, a rough yes or no. Um, from the, daily, the Daily Mail called me loquacious this week, so yes, <laughs> yes or no is very no, difficult. No, no, I'm just gonna, there's, a, there's a couple of questions. I've been told only two more, but I reckon we can squeeze in three if we're good. Okay. Um, Loquacious is a, a word I would love to be described as. Um, from, from Zoom, we have Brona who asked, does hypnosis accept unsolicited demos from songwriters? That was my yes or ish, no answer. Yes, because as I said, you know, if, if, um, and I'm, I apologize, I didn't hear her name, but if she is, you know, the next Alicia Keys, I want to know about it. <laughs> Brona? Send in, send in that demo. Uh, and from SJ, uh, again from Zoom, as an artist who is independent and writes their own songs, outside of playlists, what is the best way to build streams? Um, well, you know, if you're releasing music yourself, I think that you have to release a lot of music. So, you know, you have, you have to be confident enough in your ability as uh, a creator to be prepared to use your your own music as a loss leader, as it were. Um, and I think that you also have to um, invest in creating relationships so that people like me and people like you want to help, right? So, you know, because, you know, ultimately, whether you can afford a publicist or whether you can't afford a publicist, you can still pick up the telephone and call someone on a blog or call someone at a newspaper or call someone at a radio station or wherever the case might be and say, please take five minutes and, and, and listen to my song. And people hit me every day saying, will you listen to my song? And I say, I absolutely will. But the only thing that I ask of you is to please be patient because I've got a lot of songs to listen to. Um, it's a really good point because actually someone who hosted a panel earlier, Emanike, I first met Emanike via MySpace when he was 14. He's right. now, you know, 25. And uh, as you say, he he was so proactive and so brilliant. I was so impressed by his work. It was, he was one one among many people that, that have been in touch with me and some people work out, some people don't. But someone like, you know, someone like him whose career I end up becoming very invested in. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of projects that we're kind of working on, you know, at the moment together. So He's one of the best songwriters in the world. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. Before we go, before we go, Merck, um, actually, there's a, there was a quick follow-up question from um, Brona who uh, asked about the the songwriting. She said, um, "What?" Well, okay, she said, "How? How do songwriters send their demos to hypnosis?" Merck at hypnosissongs.com. Oh, there you go. That was. I'm not scared. No, I'm, you're not scared. <laughs> like, I'm I'm deadly serious oh, when wow. I say when I say that I'm not. You know, I'm not interested in missing out on the next great artist. That's right. Just but you have to be, but you have to be patient. Of course. It, listen, you're a busy guy. Just give us that one more time. That was Merck at hypnosis. Songs.com. .com. Okay. Um, last thing. What, what are one or two things that you'd like for people to take away from today, Merck? What, or what um, is one thing that you would like for people to really take in and, and, and take with them? 
it, this will perhaps surprise you, but it won't at the same time, which is that, you know, you'll have seen that at some point during the course of this discussion, I've changed my name to Black Lives Matter. Um, and it's really important to me that people take on board that from the days of uh, Elvis doing Arthur Big Boy Crudup songs, the Beatles doing Chuck Berry songs and Little Richard songs, the Rolling Stones doing you know, Bobby Womack songs, black music has made the world go round. And, you know, if we went to Beijing right now, we would find young Chinese kids that want to be black. If we went to the South Bank, we'd find the same thing. If we went to Brussels, Paris, you know, New York, London, London Los Angeles, wherever, you know, black culture has changed the world. And yet our brothers and sisters of color under the, uh, uh, you know, governments of people like Boris Johnson and, um, you know, particularly Donald Trump have really, really suffered. And, uh, you know, we had a moment um, in, you know, earlier in the summertime after the death of George Floyd, um, where, you know, people came together and started to do things. And I think that most people are well-intentioned and will continue to do things. But it's important to me that people recognize um, as someone that grew up in the black community, whose best friend was black, um, that uh, this has been going on, you know, I'm in my fifties now, this has been going on my entire life. And the only way that it's going to change is if everyone that's listening and everyone that they know that they can influence takes on board that they have to make it a part of their daily lives to bring this change. So, you know, we had a moment um, where when uh, the horrible murder of Ahmaud Arbery took place um, and it was there on television, on film for everyone to see. And yet the better part of, you know, three months later, his murderers had still not been arrested, uh, where I spoke to all of our songwriters in Georgia, where, uh, Ahmad had been murdered and I got their permission and I wrote a letter to the district attorney of Liberty County in Georgia where the murder had been had taken place and I basically said listen I've invested a hundred million dollars in Georgia um, in the last 18 months um, the people that I've invested the money in are all people of color they're all people that pay their taxes and spend a lot of money in the Georgia economy. Um, they write the songs for the biggest artists in the world, from Beyonce to Jay-Z to Rihanna to Madonna to Britney Spears to Mariah Carey and on and on and on. And all of these people have really loud voices and we're gonna use these voices if you don't do something about this. And two days later, we had an email acknowledging our email um, and two days after that, the first arrests had taken place. Um, and I just, I'm not saying that to pat ourselves on the back, but I'm saying it because I think it's important that every company out there starts to realize that their politics can't just be their politics. They have to be politics that represent and moves that represent the people that they make money with. And we all make money with the black community and we all have a duty to do the right thing by our brothers and sisters in, uh, of color. Um, I just wanted to add, sorry, I just wanted to add to that, Mark, sorry. Um, black lives matter, black trans lives matter as well. I'm gonna- They do indeed. Add that in, my, add that in for my peeps out there. Um, there was one last thing I was going to ask, and it's, it's really hard, but out of all of the songs you've worked on, all of the songs you've been involved with, because you are the, the king of songs right now, what's your number one? And then we'll leave, we'll go. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, I mean, I can tell you what my favourite uh, album of all time is. I can tell you what my favourite song of all time is, probably. Um, but I can't pick one out of our catalogue. Um, um, you know, um, I mean, my favorite song is probably Papa Was a Rolling Stone by The Temptations. My favorite album is Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. Um, but, you know, my tastes are everything from Stevie Wonder to Pink Floyd to John Coltrane and Miles Davis to, you know, Pusha T. Um, so, you know, and, and, and everything in between. But, 
you know, it's pretty hard to not get excited about Heart of Glass by Blondie or, you know, Brass in Pocket by The Pretenders or Sweet Dreams Are Made of This by um, Eurythmics or, you know, the incredible work that Niall and Bernard did on everything from Sister Sledge with We Are Family to Diana Ross with I'm Coming Out to, you know, the great chic songs like, you know, Good Times, La Freak, Everybody Dance, etc. So I'm very blessed. But, you know, at the same time, I look at the work that, you know, that Benny Blanco is doing right now, and I'm blown away. I look at the work that Andrew Watt is doing right now, and I'm blown away. Mark Ronson is always, you know, kind of blowing the roof off the the, the place. Um, you know, it's, 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 you know, pretty remarkable stuff. I knew I knew we'd be able to get one off you. I knew that. Mert, thank you so much for today. Kwame, thank you so much for, t- for today and for everyone for their questions. And um, stay stay here for the next panel, right? It's a pleasure. Good luck, everyone. Mm-hmm.